What are some of the media, cartoons, comedy, or music, that were formative to you in your youth that would explain what makes you you? Ooh. I've talked about this before, but... Uh, Round the Horn. I listened to it a lot with my mom. It was a uh, BBC comedy, like sketch comedy, broadly sketch comedy, uh, half-hour radio show from the 1960s. And we listened to it on cassette tape because BBC sold cassette tapes of it. You can actually get it all. I was thrilled to discover this. You can get it on uh, Apple. Uh, they've just, the BBC has just started doing like, uh, now that Apple has let you monetize podcasts, mm -hmm. there might be a better way for them to distribute this. Yeah. But at the moment, you can buy it on the, you can buy Round the Horn as uh, Apple audiobooks, um, which is, you can buy all the seasons, which is hilarious. Because I listen to, to, to like two episodes of Around the Horn, and then my phone is like, "You're reading so much. <laughs> Good job. Look at what you're reading." And I'm like, "All right, settle down." But um, uh, listen, listening to it again pretty recently, like I listened to it while we were like doing all the painting to fix up our place before we before we moved. Um, uh, it it's surprising how well it holds up. Like. Not everything. There, it's from the. It's it's a British radio comedy from the 1960s. There are one or two things that obviously don't hold up. My mic is rubbing. Sorry. Uh, that uh, obviously don't don't hold up as one might expect, but not nearly as much as I had feared. And the actual comedy that's not uncomfortable really holds up, like like surprisingly well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I listened to. Uh, uh, listened to uh, that a lot, like I said, as a kid with my mom. And one of the things that I liked about it, one of the sort of running gags, was that there was the cast of the show and then the BBC announcer. Because the BBC had, like, their staff announcers that would do, like... Because everything was live, that would bridge between programs. And they would loop the announcer into the show. And typically as, like, playing... Uh, like, playing inanimate objects. So they did a parody of The Great Escape, uh, and and he was uh, he played the tunnel. So you had like the BBC announcer going like, "I, Douglas Smith, play the tunnel. Already <laughs> I'm fifty yards long and growing every day. I'm cold and dank, and moisture runs down my sides." <laughs> and just that really, I really enjoyed that. That this like very very straight laced. Like, just the guy from the BBC that would normally be like, and now on BBC Two, it's time for the whatever report, you know? Just having him read these ridiculous lines of dialogue, I really enjoyed. So, hmm. that's mine. When I was two, I wore out a VHS tape of a Looney Tunes compilation. Nice. I, I watched a lot of Looney Tunes with my dad as a kid, too, yeah. Boy, I, 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 I'm glad I had a chance to think about this. X-Men, I, I don't think she does. That's a great question. It, oh, is it We Shop Wednesday? It's We Shop Wednesday. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Why, <laughs> that's why, that's why it's been an hour of We Shop. <laughs> it explains this, this burning desire to play Ninja Gaiden 3. Yeah. Uh, if you go with books, it's got to be asterisk and also Tintin. True. Also true for me, both, both of those. Both of which, uh, really, uh, Tintin influenced my sense of, of I guess, plotting mm. of, of a story. Mm -hmm. Asterix, definitely the humor. Uh, Audio-wise, audio that would definitely be the radio versions of the Royal Canadian Air at Farce when they were young, mm -hmm. and I was even younger. And television-wise, I... I, I I'm how did you get... How did Asku get a picture with both of them in the same picture that quickly? Did you make that? <laughs> Sorry, it's Asterix and Tintin in the same... Anyway, sorry, continuing. They must have. At, at television-wise, the first show I ever learned how to program a VCR for at the age of, I want to say, four or five was a little thing called Robotech because it was ah. only too early for me to watch TV supervised. And then just going through my head like, oh yeah, no, every show, Robotech, Astro Boy, uh, Voltron... <laughs> And then every show I actually enjoyed as a child animated, 
that was North American was already also animated by Tokyo Movie Shimsha. <laughs> so basically, I only watched anime even when I was a young child. Oh, Graham. What's up? Yeah. There's your cinemagraph. There we go. Oh, this looks, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's an insect. That is, that's mm. very strong. <laughs> yep. Thank welcome, you. Welcome to our home. Great work. Yeah, that's what it looks like when we're at home. Yep. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Yo. What's up? Tell us uh, about did yourself. You, did you have an answer for that? You don't have oh, to. Did uh, you have an answer for that? I, I was thinking about it for like kind of the whole thing, and I was like, there's a lot of media that I enjoyed when I was younger, but I, I got really hung up on the like that helps explain the way you are. Mm. And like, there's a lot of stuff that I was really into when I was younger that I like don't have as much of a connection with. So I was struggling to try and figure out like what of the things that I was into when I was younger made me the way I am now. Um, yeah, I don't know. The yeah. only the only thing that like. I don't feel like it's a very good answer, but uh, despite being the one person not in uniform, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation was quite formative for me. Yeah. And yeah. the the idea of sci-fi as like going around and solving problems and exploring and helping people and all that good stuff, rather than like it would shoot shoot the mans. Yeah. You know. So. Agreed. I like that. Uh, I did also have to... I, my dad likes telling the story of the time that he had to explain to me that it wasn't real. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Well, because it takes place in space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So as a very young child, I thought that, well, okay, we're down here on the planet and I'm watching what's going on up there. Obviously. Yeah. There's people in space. Those people. Hmm. Uh, it turns out it's not quite that way. Darn. Hey, Boomer, what do you got? Uh... I actually have a copy right here. I oh, reread this book when I was older and looked back and realized that, like... Oh, bus stop. Cool. It's Too about strong. a princess who decided that everything about being a princess sucked, and she ran away and made herself the personal assistant to a dragon and <laughs> did a bunch of really impressive and cool things just by being really competent and clever and not taking any bus from anybody and, like... Is that... <laughs> nice. Oh, that's... Who I've been trying to be my whole life. That sounds awesome. What's, yeah. what's the book? I didn't actually see it. Wait, come back. Come back. Boomer. Yeah. Chat says it's called Dealing with Dragons. Uh, it is... Dealing with Dragons. Dealing with Dragons. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's reverse Kobayashi. <laughs> <laughs> I love it's, it. Uh, the first, it's the first of four. That's great. Wait, sorry. Is that what you okay. were doing? Uh... Ben and or Max, did did either of you want to weigh in on that uh, on that question about formative media? You don't you don't have to, but sure, yeah, yeah, all right. Uh, mm -hmm. What you got, Max? It's Star Wars. Star I Wars. A lot of Star Wars as a kid. Heck yes. Uh, original trilogy. Um, I think, yeah, the, the the prequel trilogy I've seen like once through when it came out. <laughs> We've uh, all seen it once. It's mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't really I remember. I remember seeing the third one in theaters in Prince George with Kathleen, and yeah. we came oh. out of it going like. That one was all right. I went to episode one like three times. It's yeah, um, but yeah, the original trilogy I watched a lot, and I had a lot of the the expanded universe books and stuff like that growing up with those. Uh, also have memories of watching um, the uh, the Marx Brothers with my dad because uh, my dad was a bit mm -hmm. older than average and had sort of tastes from the fifties and sixties. Uh, and there's a very formative, uh, CD, um, Alistair Fraser's Dawn Dance, which came out in the mid nineties. You can find it on Bandcamp. It's exceptional. Uh, it's highly recommended. Uh, and I list, I've listened to that thing into the ground. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, I'm going back to my regular voice. <laughs> uh, but uh, I played a tremendous amount of the Heroes of Might and Magic uh, series growing up. Um, in is it non-video games or we do it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. No? I think okay. it's just media. We just didn't okay. have video games when we were kids. Ah, right. <laughs> All you had were your, uh, your 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 wheel and stick. Or your yeah. The ball, the ball and the cow. The ball and the cow. Yeah. 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 But yeah, I played a lot of Heroes of Might and Magic growing up. Um, mm -hmm. Like a ton and ton of it. And I recently discovered, actually, that it still has, like, a deep fan base mm -hmm. um, with, like, people actively streaming it on Twitch and stuff, which is really, really cool. 
um, and like a mod community and stuff. Uh, and there is a new game uh, coming out that I am forgetting the name. So is it Song of Conquest? Something like that. There's a new game coming out that's basically inspired by that series, and it looks really, 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 really cool. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about it. It's supposed to come out like Q1 next year. So, hmm. In we'll high see. school, my friends played so much Heroes of Might and Magic. I'm sure James can talk can speak to this, but hours sink away so yeah. until yeah. until the until the sun came up. There it and is. And to the point that uh, a friend of mine he 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 played it uh, so so much and then fell asleep that when his dad came in the next morning to tell him that he had to get out of bed because they were going to a, a to, they were going to a wedding that day. <laughs> um, my friend just lay there for a few minutes, sort of catatonic in bed because he couldn't find the menu option to get up. He was, he was like, how do I get out of bed? There's no nothing in the sub-menus. Yeah. Um, and on another note, actually, I just kind of thought about it because uh, it's like relevant to child's play mm. and stuff. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, like 10, my appendix burst. Good. Uh, so I had to stay a couple, uh, like a, about like a week or two in the hospital. Um, and I was in pediatrics and they had like a little play area with a computer that was like hard. Like its OS was basically like, you can play these hospital games. <laughs> and they're all like educational kind of ones and whatnot. And my dad, uh, who worked in tech at the time, uh, <laughs> went onto the computer and in back installed a bunch of mame games and Aww. stuff in into the uh, into the into the thing. So it's like he like hit it within like folders on there. That's and so good. when I was uh, yeah, I would I would go into it and uh, and yeah, I got to play mame games and stuff hanging out in uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the in the hospital. So. That is rad. Cool. Yeah, yeah, shout out to my dad. If only there was some sort of an organization back yeah. then that could yeah. provide entertainment to kids in the hospital mm. through the form of video games. It's what could it be? Huh. As a ten-year-old who was like alone in the hospital for several weeks, it was a very helpful thing. <laughs> there you go.